Hello and welcome into the first ever video edition of Round Ball Roundup. If I could just have him hold this. Nice try, buddy. Uh, well, he's not going to be holding a basketball, but we are still part of the Dogs Media Network. And you can follow along with the journey at collegefootballdogs.com. We do have plans to expand further into the basketball and baseball offerings. And I'm proud to bring to you the first ever basketball offering, at least to my knowledge. Uh, so hopefully one day we can have a website dedicated to basketball by itself and more coverage by more people, more writers covering more teams and more conferences. But this one here specifically is going to be focused on the Sun Belt itself. I do plan on having some guests from time to time. Uh, if there are those of you who have watched the football version you know that T.J. Corman, former App State wide receiver, joins me for those. Obviously, he has an open invitation to join this whenever he'd like. And we'd also like some people who've got some experience playing basketball or covering basketball. I've appeared on Trevor Everett's uh, The Two Pointers podcast, which is focused on college basketball and also does a little bit of NBA stuff. So follow along with, with him as well. I'm certainly hoping that he will jump on and join us here at some point down the, rot, down the line. Uh, he was at the App State Auburn game in person, so that was pretty cool. We'll obviously talk about that. Talk about the Sun Belt overall. So from what we see from the standings, we know that there is quite a disparity from top to bottom at the moment, but that's just the very top and the very bottom. Right now we have seven teams right there in the middle sitting one game over 500. Uh, that's not great. That's not bad. And obviously that depends specifically on the schedule of each one of those teams. Uh, and I am going to try and bring a look at the standings up as we talk here uh, and take a look at that. Just so we've got something to look at as I speak about it. So obviously very few conference games have taken place, although it doesn't appear the Sun Belt has kept up with this for whatever reason, unless James Madison versus Old Dominion was not considered part of conference play. Uh, they actually have already played each other, so there should be at least a stat line there for those two teams uh, with James Madison. Obviously, being undefeated, they actually took it to Old Dominion at their place pretty well, uh, unfortunately for Monarch fans to start out with. I do want to remind you that this first show isn't going to have a ton of structure because I want to see where this goes. I want to see how many people we have jump in here, make comments, questions. Uh, I am not the best basketball expert by any means, uh, but I hope to provide just some basic coverage so that we can all become more interested in Sunbelt basketball. This league has been a one bid league for a very long time. Uh, early on this season, it still looks like it could be a one-bid league yet again. Uh, I'm hopeful that James Madison can continue their run, unless they play App State, who is my team, for those of you, again, who maybe not have caught on to the football coverage side of things. Uh, but those top two teams continue to do well through conference play. Maybe you're looking at an outside shot, but that's a lot further into the future. A lot of things have to happen, a lot of unknowns. Uh, it's based on the rest of NCAA basketball, whether the Sun Belt could possibly be looking at uh, two teams versus one. Uh, we put only one in last year. It was Louisiana Ragin' Cajuns. This conference, uh, and we'll go over this as we go over the standings a little bit closer, but this conference lost a lot, a lot of talent from last season with Jordan Brown transferring out from Louisiana, a big point, a focal point on that championship Sun Belt team. Uh, in, in the postseason tournament for the Sun Belt. Obviously, for those that do or maybe don't remember, Southern Miss did take the regular season championship and was highly regarded as one of the favorites to win again this season. But they were decimated with er, uh, injuries before the season even really got started. So they are probably about where they should be with ha all of what's happened with them, uh, sitting at 5-4 and four currently. Uh, but I think with a full roster, with a healthy roster, they probably could be right up there at the top with App State uh, and possibly even James Madison. Uh, but that is what it is. You can't change that. You have to roll with the punches that come with injuries, and hopefully most of the teams can stay healthy. Otherwise, I don't think off the top of my head there's any other major injuries early yet this season. 
Uh, I know that we had we had a couple bad looks uh, last year, and luckily it wasn't any dirty type of fouls, but just guys landing weirdly, uh, a couple guys getting taken off the court uh, by medical professionals. So hopefully a little bit less of that this year. Uh, but I think for the most part, I haven't seen too much of that just yet. So, you know, out of conference play, hopefully everyone's getting comfortable and confident before they get into the conference mark and start heating up. We know the records. We've kind of gone over that. Uh, we've got the two top teams sitting with just zero in James Madison's case losses and ranked number 20 in the nation. So that's a good mark on the conference early on. We've got a ranked team that other teams will actually have a shot at beating. And so that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, I know, you know, a lot of people were sick of James Madison toting themselves as the big uh, power team when it came to football, but we want that in basketball. We really, really need that in basketball because no one looks at the Sun Belt in a very favorable light when it comes to NCAA basketball. They just don't. Uh, if you look at the attendance right now, and actually I believe for all of last season, the four newest teams have the best attendance in the entire conference. So that leads me to believe that the South is just vastly more focused on football and baseball. I don't think that's really a big shock, but uh, I was a little surprised. Although one of the four new teams is Southern Miss. So we do have to mention that they're obviously very far South. But the other three teams are quite a bit more north than most of the other teams within the conference, certainly far more north than most of the teams in the West, uh, besides Arkansas State, who's kind of getting closer there. But I think we see in general, you know, the Big Ten's big focus is basketball. Uh, after football, it's real close to basketball. Baseball is pretty horrible. Uh, I would say the Sun Belt uh, outpaces them in baseball without much of a question. So we have that to hang our hat on. Uh, we'll also be trying to cover that for you in video form this year to kind of give you something else to to look at and look forward to. But back to the standings overall, and what I really wanted to focus on is early season road struggles. Uh, some of these teams that we're playing early on are power teams or in basketball known as major teams because everybody in the Sun Belt would be considered a mid-major. As a reminder, we don't have any small or large private institutions within the Sun Belt. So there's really not going to be anybody who farly or greatly outpaces anybody else uh, with dollar amounts in that regard. There are disparities, okay? Louisiana Monroe is one of the least funded teams in NCAA, whether it's basketball or otherwise. Uh, so they need to do whatever they can with the collectives and NIL to kind of bring that up. But throughout much of the rest of the conference, it's pretty even when it comes to basketball funding. Um, there are a couple teams at the top that do have a little bit more money. James Madison's got a, a newer facility. Apparently gets really loud within there when you, when you get in there for a game. Old Dominion has a really nice facility. Uh, App State's been using their convocation center for a very long time for basketball. Serves them well. Seats about 8,000 people. They've really struggled to fill that place up. Uh, I think literally kind of sold it out a handful of times. Uh, but, oh, excuse me. It's harder when TJ's not here that I have to try and carry this all by myself. But uh, we do have the Big Ten backers jumping in. Uh, if you're looking for football coverage, jump on over to their show tonight. I believe they're going live about 9 o'clock. Uh, AJ or Steve, whichever one it is, could maybe let us know, too, uh, that they've been putting their show together and ready for another good one tonight uh, if you follow along with the Big Ten backers. Appreciate them tuning in. So... Early season road struggles. We have the Cajuns, who are 3-0 and at home, but 0-3 on the road. We've got the Troy Trojans, who are 4-1 and at home, but 0-4 on the road. We have Arkansas State, who's just 2-1 and at home, so not a, a necessarily great mark there, but 0-5 on the road. And we obviously have uh, Old Dominion. Actually, not obviously, but we have obviously Georgia Southern bringing up the rear with an 0 and 6 mark, but they haven't won any games yet this year. So that is, you know, not, not, not something that was needed to be said too much. Uh, I know Georgia Southern fans are greatly disappointed in that start, but frankly, they are a rebuilding program right now. They've got a newer coach. They got guys who left the program transfers coming in. They need to gel together. They will win, will win more games throughout the season However, 
it's going to be a struggle. It's going to continue to be a struggle. You don't start off the season 0 and 9 and expect a large turnaround and, and be pushing for, uh, you know, a tournament bid. It's just not going to happen. But there may be some promise as they go along. And I think you're going to see that uh, as we go and progress through the season, that this team is getting better. The chemistry is improving and the coaching is bringing the, these guys together. But, you know, it could go the other way. There's obviously the possibility, and NIL is going to fuel that, unfortunately. But, again, I think there's still plenty of time. It's still early. They haven't got a single conference loss to worry about yet, so they're still alive as far as conference play goes. We'll see what they can get done. The surprise to me, so on Trevor's Two-Pointers podcast, he asked me for a dark sleeper team, like a deep sleeper. People aren't going to really talk about this team. I took a chance and a flyer on Old Dominion. Uh, what I saw from them last season really impressed me overall. I thought that they never really truly out of games. Uh, they didn't necessarily dominate t- teams that they did beat. So that was maybe something that I should have paid a little bit closer attention to. But I thought every game was close and every game was down to the wire feeling. Uh, there were a couple games that were a little bit further away. But for the most part, a lot of their losses were within four or five points. So there wasn't a whole lot of concern about dropping games by a lot of points. Uh, uh, you know, one player probably makes a big difference on a team like that. Uh, one little coaching change defensively or offensively can make a big change when it comes to those types of things. So I was surprised when I took Old Dominion and they looked good early in the season at a ranked Arkansas team. Uh, I think they only ended up losing by, again, like five, six points in that game there. But now they sit at... 0-4 on the road, just 3-2 and two at home. So they're not overly impressive at home to kind of make up for the road struggles. And they really find themselves at, at the bottom there with Georgia Southern. So to me, I would say our uh, Old Dominion is even more of a surprising start, poor start, than Georgia Southern is to me. Again, with a coaching change and philosophy change, that's probably what we're going to see. And our, our number one fan, Artie Cat, is here for a little basketball action. I you know I don't know how closely Artie follows Texas State basketball, but they were a, a perennial favorite there for a little while, and uh, one of the favorites last season, uh, and probably had what most people would say is a is a disappointing season for where they thought they'd finish. Um, but Mason Harrell was on the team last year, thought of to be one of the best players in the conference going in. Had some struggles. Uh, I think they they lost to. Oh, man, I can't remember if it's NAIA or a Division II team or what the difference was, but it was a team down there locally in Texas who beat them on their home court. So a little bit of a struggle there for them early part of the season, but we'll see if they can bounce back. They've got uh, one of the better players uh, last night that just went off for about 20 points, so we'll see if they can continue that as they go along and grab another quick drink here again it, it's a little different when you don't have a uh, co-host to help you out in these moments but we we prevail uh so to note again we've got some streaks that are good at the top with james madison going nine game win streak and app state close behind with a six game win streak of note with app state's pretty good mark of seven and two really only one bad loss that i'd say so far and that was i think around 20 points to northern illinois Their other loss was an overtime loss as they traveled across the country to Corvallis to play Oregon State when they lost there uh, in overtime. So you're thinking they could have, they're real close to having two major victories already this season. Uh, One underrated victory that they did have, maybe even bigger than the Auburn victory, honestly. Auburn victories at home in front of fans and, you know, the place was going crazy. In fact, maybe while we're uh, talking about that, we'll bring that up real quick, see how this ending played out but um they were in this game and competing very well throughout most of it you can see the the missed shot here can't control the rebound until app state gets a hold of it game ends court rush pretty cool moment especially for app state who hasn't had a whole lot of big great moments historically throughout their basketball program uh so it was just fun to see great to see i got to watch this one uh i had the wisdom teeth removal for those of you again who've been kind of following along Got to watch this one from the comfort of my couch, uh, but the place was loud and going pretty crazy. So cool to see that type of a moment there for App State in that game. Get back to the stand so we don't get kicked off for showing too much uh, 
copyrighted coverage uh, is what you know usually we get in trouble for. So we're just trying to do the short stuff. Um, but again, to note, App State, pretty good mark. Again, I, I'm not really sure what happened in that Mac Sunbelt Challenge with uh, Northern Illinois. Uh, definitely just a game that kind of got away from them. But impressive at home, 5-0 and mark. They don't have the toughest schedule just yet. A lot of our teams play quite a few NAIA Division II type schools early in the season. When we do play ranked opponents, we don't have a good record. James Madison has that early season victory against uh, Michigan State that they pulled off. We'll see the ending of that one here real quick. Only up one point here near the end of the game in overtime, actually, I should say. And uh, Horton's going to get the ball over here to the right side, three-point. Nail it. Go on top. Michigan State would never catch up. They go on to win this game there in Lansing uh, to start their season and start what's you know obviously now become their ranking in NCAA basketball, and I think at that point in time, I believe they were ranked in both football and basketball. A feat very few Sun Belt teams have probably ever pulled off before, if ever. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of one previously, so it might have been the first time ever. Uh, so, yeah, they're the only team to beat a ranked opponent so far this season. One of few teams who have beaten a major program uh, from the Sun Belt. Again, we touched on App State's victory over Auburn, but Auburn was not a ranked team. And uh, I do think, again, that that UNCW victory was probably better in the long run with who UNCW has beat. Uh, they have taken down Kentucky, and App State beat Wilmington, UNC Wilmington, by about 20 points. So it was a very convincing victory uh, for them in that one. And uh, just as a reminder, haven't really got any questions yet. Just throw out what you want. Uh, a little trash talk, you know, just telling me I'm wrong about something, that's fine. Let's hear it. I mean, this is... Just a, a show to have a little fun with. I hope that maybe we can have somebody just jump in video-wise at some point. Uh, not necessarily tonight, but somewhere down the road. Uh, make this a little bit more interactive uh, like we do for the football version. I would love that. But we'll see what happens with that as we go down the line. I do want to say, now that we've kind of covered most of the um, – Standings. We'll get back into some of the players that I want to look at for the Sun Belt overall early on. So when I look at this, I start off with the national look because it gives you the best picture of how our guys are looking compared to the rest of the country, right? So quickly, we had a couple guys near the top of a lot of these lists early last season. Once conference play started, a lot of that stuff started to shift uh, because the games became more competitive. Quite frankly, I think James Madison. If I remember what my tagline was, was about uh, four or five weeks into the season. They were tops in points per game as a team throughout the country. Some of that had to do with, again, you know, NAIA, Division II type schools, that they were kind of running the scores up against a little bit, not the greatest of competitions. But again, we had a lot of individuals that were also a part of a lot of those rankings. Uh, Mika Hanlogden, uh, Justin Abson was up there. Uh, we had Jordan Brown up there. Uh, we had um, Davion Kinsley from Marshall. A couple of these guys are, well, not a couple, all those guys except for Justin Epson are all now gone from the conference, uh, whether it's via transfer or graduation. So we had a lot of talent to replace, quite frankly. And, and to be honest with you, quite early on as a conference overall, I'm not saying individual teams here, but as a conference overall, we did not replace that many guys. We really didn't replace that many guys, at least not guys that came in and produced, can produce or are able to produce where their previous counterparts had left off. So what we need to see now is the development of these players in these mid-major programs. That's what mid-majors are going to have to do. Again, much like power conferences in football, we're playing with less money and less intangibles uh, as far as facilities uh, and amenities that we can offer these kids to come and play in the Sun Belt. But we still do have some talented players in this conference, and we're going to make mention of them here in just a second. So I want to start off with points per game leader. So this is, again, national ranking here, and then we'll talk about them within the conference as well. But nationally, we have Kobe Julian down in Louisiana sitting at number 19 in points per game with 
0.6. And this is me looking through, by the way, about 50, the first 50 or so in each statistical category. But I want to make mention he's the only one from the Sun Belt at 20.6 points per game. So a great step there for Louisiana to get going in the right direction after some early season struggles. In rebounds per game, we actually have two players located within the top 20, and they're very close to each other. And I'm going to butcher this name, so I do apologize. Janika Ojoko, Ojoko, I think maybe, uh, for Coastal Carolina, comes in at number 20 with 9.9 rebounds, just shy of 10 rebounds per game. That's a big-time thing. Uh, They had uh, Mustafa there last season. Uh, I honestly didn't think... He probably had the season he really wanted. I know that he was a bigger name coming into the season. And as the season progressed, I wasn't seeing maybe the statistics that I thought would back up uh, his play. So it'll be interesting to see if um, Ojoko can pick up that end end of things. And so far, it looks like he has coming in as the top-ranked Sunbelt player in the country in that mark. We also have Nate Marshall at number 27, so just seven spots Below him, Nate Nate Martin comes in from Marshall with 9.6 rebounds per game. So we have some guys on the boards who can get up there and get those rebounds and start the offense going the other way. So that's a good thing for both of those teams as they, uh, again, had some early season struggles. Marshall probably had lost, I would consider, the most amount of talent from last season to this season. So it'll be interesting to see if, they get the scoring they're going to need because it looks like they've got somebody on the defensive end that can really help them out and turn that into some quick offense. But you're going to have to produce or find a guy who can produce as much as uh, Tavion Kinsley and, uh, oh, I'm going blank on the other guy's name. They had another great three-point shooter last year. I'm going blank because I can only think of uh, Terrence Edwards for uh, James Madison instead of him. Um, But regardless, uh, they had another player who was a really good three-point shooter for Marshall last year that they're also have to replace. It's good to see you. Uh, Thanks for joining the stream, Neil. App State has top five guy in blocks. Yes, they do. We're about to get to that one uh, because no one is listed in the top 50 for assist. So interestingly enough, we have some, some good scores in this league. Again, Kobe Julian far outpacing everybody else, but we don't have anybody distributing the ball Within the top 50, that was a little bit of a surprise to me when you have some guys that are putting up some points that you don't have a little bit more consistent person given the rock. Uh, Themis Folks was high up in that category last year, getting the ball down low to Jordan Brown and passing around the perimeter for some other looks uh, for the Cajuns to have a good offense. But um, yeah, Artie's chiming in here. T.J. Bickerstaff of James Madison was Sunbelt Player of the Week after the upset victory. Yes, I I didn't know that off the top of my head. I'll be quite honest. I didn't realize it was him. Um, But, yeah, they – and and what's great about that game and also with the Auburn game with App State, so those are the two hallmark victories for this conference so far this season. I watched both those games. It's not a stroke of luck, you know, uh, App State was a better team throughout the Auburn game. Now, there was something interesting said during the broadcast that made a little sense to me, which was they probably could have hammered the ball down low. Auburn could have and had a little bit more success down low trying to get Appalachian State into some foul trouble. They didn't really do that. They tried to kind of catch back up through the three, the outside shots. Full credit to App State for being strong defensively in the paint to make them think that that's what they had to do because it did seem like couple times they probably could have just gone down low. Uh, but again, as Neil's mentioned, you got at Justin Absent who comes in at number four in the country. Again, not in the conference, in the country at three blocks per game. And I think at one point in time, maybe even earlier last season, his average was more than that. Man, I'm sorry, having to drink a lot of water tonight. I'm not used to talking this much. Uh, maybe the wisdom teeth being removed has a, a part of that. But uh, Neil also wants to mention that um, Cliff Ellis retired the other day citing NIL and transfer portal. Um, yeah, he did. Uh, the, the NCAA all-time active wins leader retired from Coastal Carolina basketball. I think he should have retired last year. and That's not a um, disrespect to him at all. Obviously a great coach in his own right. 
Uh, but it seemed as if his team should have been a little bit better than they were, should have performed a little higher, and, and they just weren't doing it. Whether it was his coaching or whether it was just the guys not following what he wanted to run uh, or doing it appropriately, uh, it just didn't seem like when I'm watching on the sidelines that these guys were totally invested in what their coach had to say at, at TV timeouts and such. It's probably a big part of the age discrepancy, and like he says, he just doesn't want to put up with essentially free agency. We know that's really what it's become in football. I don't think it's quite at that level of basketball. But again, we saw a lot of guys, really talented guys, from last season now transfer out uh, and leave this conference and unfortunately leave it in a worse place than where it was last year. I think had a lot of that talent stayed, especially early on this season, we're quite possibly looking at people talking about a two-bid league early because you've got a couple teams with the just one or zero losses. Um, it would be hard to get multiple teams in the Sun Belt ranked. I think that would be very, very difficult to see happen because you've got just too many established programs. It's not like football where there's as much parity. A lot of the blue bloods in basketball stay blue bloods for a very, very long time, whereas football seems to have this, again, this more free-flowing portal and NIL stuff going on and collectives that are really – changing the, the face of football as we know it. Uh, and that's because in large part, it's large rosters where you can see a lot of discrepancy and change very quickly. Uh, when you've got smaller, more confined teams like you do in basketball, I think it's a lot more to do with chemistry and you, you don't want as many changes, especially if you're a good team, because that messes up the chemistry. And just because you bring in somebody who may be more talented, maybe they don't distribute the ball as well to their teammates. And that causes locker room issues. Again, these are all different marks you have to think about when, you, when you're looking at basketball compared to football. Uh, Neil also says Auburn could have given that guy down low. He could have had 30. Yes, I, 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 tr I truly believe that that's also true. And uh, when they said that on the broadcast as I'm sitting at home, I'm like, you know, thinking back and then they're showing some highlights. It seemed evident that they could have had a lot more success down low. Uh, but, you know. Again, you got Justin Absent down there, and you got some other guys. Uh, Spill, uh, Spiller, I believe it's Spiller. I'm still trying to get used to everybody's names. They're going from football to, to basketball with a lot of different rosters. Uh, so I believe it's uh, Spiller, who's also down there low for App State, having a lot of early season success as we get into it. And uh, he's also saying, Neil, that you, in basketball you have to have three good guys. Yeah, you definitely do. I think that was a, in large part why Marshall had so much success last year. They had Mika Hanlogan, uh, Tavion Kinsley, and again, that third name that I'm going blank on. If there are any Marshall fans watching along, if you would chime in and let me know which name I'm forgetting. I could probably pull it up as well, but it might be quicker if you just type it in and let us know. Uh, but yeah, so Justin Absent, let's get back to the, the shot blocking. Uh, he's number four overall, right behind him. Number five, literally, in Texas State's Brandon Love. If are you still watching along uh, I'm, as we as I struggle through this one by myself, uh, number five in the country at 2.9 blocks per game. So, again, directly behind Justin Absence, it's pretty cool to see two of our guys, the big guys, uh, having a lot of early season success in the blocks uh, because – like I said, we don't have as many guys lighting up the scoreboard this year. Um, we do have Terrence Edwards coming in. Again, Kobe Julian, number one in the conference, but we have Terrence Edwards from James Madison right behind him. That's not ultimately all that surprising because we know James Madison is a very good, undefeated, unranked team. And that also makes sense that T.J. Bickerstaff, who Neil just mentioned, or I'm sorry, Artie just mentioned, is fourth on that list. So two guys within the top five in the conference for James Madison as far as scoring the rock goes. We also have Chauncey Jenkins from ODU. It's sitting at 16.7 points in third place. And Austin Crowley, Crowley, I think it is actually, from Southern Miss, one of the better players all of last season. Again, had Southern Miss not been decimated by injuries before this season really got rolling, uh, could Austin have even more points per game at this point? Uh, he might be closer to uh, Terrence Edwards, who's sitting up there at 17.9, if he had a little bit more help around him. But that remains to be seen. As far as defensive leaders and rebounds, uh, Joko from Coastal is number one. Obviously, Nate Martin followed, is following him, as we know from this list already. TJ Bickerstaff 
comes in at number three. So very well-rounded, obviously scoring the buckets and getting the rebounds underneath the basket as well. Again, in large part of why James Madison has had so much early season success. Uh, Jumping down to the assist, the guy I thought would be leading the assist is leading the assist. So we got famous Fultz from Louisiana, great distributor of the ball. He was actually picking up the pace very early this season in scoring the points himself. Uh, Again, Kobe Julian has taken that over and become their go-to guy to get the bucket. Uh, But Themis Folks, obviously a very dangerous player, very shifty, uh, kind of a, let's see if I can pull up his his height, actually. Yeah, he's only 6'1", actually from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, so just down the road from where I'm at. Uh, 6'1", 175. I'd say he looks a little bit taller than that on the court um, to me, but he's a slender guy. Uh, so he can get around a lot of the defensive stuff real easily because he's just so lean and quick. So makes sense why he leads in the assist because he's getting he's getting away from the defense to get open passes to distribute the ball to uh, the guys on the team. Uh, and again, that one, the most obvious one being Kobe Julian. And uh, Neil says, that wasn't a knock on apps post players. I sat right behind the Auburn bench and tall lefty was a man tall and thick. He says, yeah, he was a big dude. Uh, it, it, he didn't seem to be overly dominant and maybe that's why they just refused to kind of go to him. But interesting that they, they didn't really try and stuff that tactic there even more. Another player I was really impressed with last season, who I think has got a well-rounded game as well as Dewan Odom uh, from Georgia state. He's sitting there at 4.4 assists per game. Georgia State was one of those teams, I think, a couple years ago, a lot of people thought would be kind of the the head and shoulders, the go-to team within the conference, within the Sun Belt. Uh, But once they lost their head coach and uh, the head coach's son, who was also on the roster at the same time, they had gone to the uh, NCAA tournament, if you could remember, uh, when he got up to celebrate, I think he tore an ACL or something like that. I know he was in some kind of, you know, boot situation or leg strapped uh, on a, on the bench with, you know, a little stool set up so he could keep his leg straight while he's coaching in the tournament. Uh, but ever since then, they've got, they've had some struggles. It's interesting to me that they're towards the bottom of the conference as far as attendance goes. And I think, I believe they just opened up their brand new arena last year. So a little disappointing to hear. There's obviously a lot of competition down there in the Atlanta area for basketball. Uh, especially with the Atlanta Hawks being there, your your tickets obviously are going to be more expensive for a pro team, but let's be honest, the pro team is going to draw pretty well whether they're winning or losing because of what the NBA can bring in the door from out of town. Unfortunately for us in the Sun Belt, I don't really know how many true tried and true NBA prospects we have to tote, you know, when uh, when our teams show up on the road. So until we get to that point, uh You know, it's going to be a struggle for a lot of our teams that struggle with attendance to really up their attendance a whole lot when it comes to conference time. We're our best shot at really improving the attendance marks is having some big teams come from out of conference, such as Auburn coming to App State. Uh, That was their first major power program or major basketball program to come up the mountain uh, since 2000 when UNC came up to help open up the Homes Convocation Center. So 23 years. 23 years before they had a major, another major college basketball program come up the mountain. These are the kinds of struggles that you have as mid-major programs, and that's got to improve to transition or or improve people's thought process when it comes to Sunbelt basketball. Uh, I, again, I think a lot of people think very highly of Sunbelt baseball. We've got to get the basketball onto that same level uh, and hopefully rather quickly now, again, that we've had some newer teams join and have some pretty early success within this conference. Uh, so getting back to the blocks, we had Justin Absent and Brandon Love both at the top nationally. Again, that's obviously continuing there. And Trayvon Spillers. So Trayvon Spillers was the name I was thinking of for App State. So that App State's got two guys there at the top for blocks per game within the conference. Again, this is not the national stuff. Now, uh, Ojoku uh, for Coastal uh, is up there as well. Three-pointers made. Okay, here's the name I was thinking of. Uh, Oh, no, no, that's... Yes, it is. Camden Kerfman for Marshall. That was the three-point shooter I was thinking of from last season. 
All I had to do was scroll down a little further, and I could find his name there for that one. Uh, Camden Kerfman at 2.63 pointers per game. Kobe Julian leads the way, obviously, with points per game. That's not much of a, a shock. Uh, he's at 2.7. So we've got a lot of guys who are scoring close to the same amount of three-pointers uh, per game. Noah Friedel from James Madison's up there at 2.6 as well. And uh, Lane from Georgia State sitting at 2.6. Michael Green from JMU. Yeah, JMU's got scores of the basketball bottom line. Uh, and they got one big guy down low. Uh, is going to take care of it in Bickerstaff. So again, well-rounded team, and they've even got one uh, one guy in the top five for steals. That'd be Raycon Horton, who we just saw hit that three against Michigan State. By the way, that was his first shot of the. Uh, I'm not sorry. Maybe it wasn't his first shot. It was his first made basket of the night. It was a swished three pointer with the game kind of on the line, if you will, in overtime on the road against a ranked opponent. Heck of a shot. Unbelievable that that is how he helps deliver the dagger to the Spartans uh, and get James Madison to where they are now. Quite frankly, if you don't win that game, you're not a ranked team. Uh, You had to win that game along with all the others to be this ranked at this point of the season. Uh, So that is what they have done there. And uh, let's just talk a little bit about what's coming up uh, as far as scores go in fact we have three games going on tonight so i'm going to jump into those and give you a little live live thing as we sit here now if i can do this correctly i I just keep clicking the wrong thing scores is what i want to click on so that i can get to the right spot here we had tennessee taking down georgia southern actually not bad i think they covered the spread I, i think the spread was like 30 some points you had number 12 tennessee taking down Georgia Southern 74 to 56, a lot better of a second half by Georgia Southern than it was in the first half. Pretty ugly there, almost 50 to 21 in the first half. Uh, And then we had, uh, let's see, get to the Sun Belt itself. I guess I was just on the ranked teams where Tennessee was at. We had Troy dismantling Southern New Orleans 110 to 63. So a good show in there. You know, those are the types of teams you just have to beat and move on, and we have Sam Houston State and Monroe. Monroe didn't really talk about them just yet, okay? So let's talk about them for a second. Monroe was a very surprising team to me last season, very impressive overall. Uh, They fell apart a bit bit towards the end of conference play, and they weren't the greatest outside of conference play. In fact, they were really unimpressive outside of conference play, if you ask me, uh, from last season. But they rounded into form within the conference, and they were very formidable. Um, They have... And I think is it uh, I think them and Southern Miss both have those old school circular type uh, basketball arena. I mean, everything's kind of a circle, but it's not really an oval shape. It really is more of a true circle uh, as far as the stands are concerned. Very interesting. Um, I last season was the first season I really paid as much attention to Sunbelt basketball. Uh, I really got into it. Um, if you really want to nerd out, you can go back and watch a bunch of videos I posted last year where I tried to talk way too much about each team in each matchup and decided I'm not going to put that type of effort in this year because we can do this video content podcast now instead of doing uh, little videos that were four and five minutes long every single day. But anyway, back to my original point, which was Monroe was vastly more impressive than I thought they'd be as a team and as a program overall. And I think you can probably see some aspects of that happening again early this season. I got, a guy named Bolden out there who's been impressive so far. Uh, and again, they're not blowing any doors off. They're only four and three so far on the year, but they were kind of like this again last year. And so when they get into conference play, I think you're going to see them still be competitive, very competitive. Even so, even though right now they aren't near the very top. Uh, well, I guess they actually are kind of near the very top because we're, we're, we're not in conference play yet. So, all those teams sitting around 500, it's it's hard to sort out exactly where they're going to fall with just a couple more games played. That could change pretty drastically. But they are actually sitting in third as far as the standings are concerned uh, right now before we truly get into conference play. But they are a two-game win streak, uh, and after today, hopefully, they'll be on a three-game win streak. But they've got to take care of uh, Sam Houston State, the Bobcats of Sam Houston State before that can happen as far as other formidable teams that we need to keep an eye out uh troy also rounds into form pretty well 
once uh, the conference slate starts opening up. So expect them to compete. Texas State, much of the same way. Uh, Texas State, though, again, as we talked about a little bit before, a little bit of a disappointing season overall. Um, they've got to really get back together with what was being what was done to be successful beforehand. I think they tried to change too much from what I could pick up on uh, from last season, well, two seasons ago to last season. Uh, and then I haven't watched them enough yet this year to honestly see uh, the, you know, anything outside of the statistics. I haven't seen much of the eye test. So we'll have to see what they do to get things rolling once we get into conference play. Uh, I hope this program, this round ball roundup can be a little bit more of something to provide some aspects of basketball coverage for the Sun Belt. Uh, I know that a lot of others are trying to do these things for other conferences, uh, but a lot of them have more of a historically good program or team, and we do not have that to my knowledge base. Uh, you know, with some of the newer teams coming in, it's hard, but we haven't really had a tried and true uh, let's just, I'll say this one, a Memphis type team where it's like every year, you know, Memphis is going to be good every year. When Memphis comes to town, you want to go to that game because they're going to have some guys that are possibly NBA team, uh, NBA players, or just some big names, uh, because their team's pretty good. So even if they don't end up in the NBA, it doesn't, doesn't matter, but they just have some really good college basketball players. And you know, you want to go see them when they come to town. We don't really have that. Um, I hope something like that can get established. Obviously, early on so far this season, that's going to be James Madison because they're a ranked team. That's quite simple. Uh, I, it would be interesting to see, had, had JMU dropped that first game to Michigan State, where people would think of them right now. I still don't think, in my heart, that they would be a ranked team had they dropped that one and won all the others. But these are the types of seasons that you need as a conference when you have the standing of the Sun Belt overall in the big picture, okay? No one from the outside right now is saying this is a two-bid league all of a sudden because App State happens to be 7-2 and two and James Madison is 9-0. and oh. Way too early to get too excited about that type of thing. Uh, it is fun to think about, I guess, especially if you're a fan of one of those two teams. But it's far too early to put a stamp of approval on anything like that. We will have to kind of keep checking back. Uh, and again, not much structure in this first episode, not many graphics. I didn't really want to focus too much time on, um, the pretty side of things. I just wanted to get into this and start talking out loud, literally to hear myself talk and hopefully get some interaction about what some people wanted to see through this, uh, or thoughts or processes or ideas. So if there's something maybe you're seeing because you're watching this after it's aired live, or you just want to give me some pointers, I'm very open to criticisms and critiques. I know one of the biggest things is I'd love to find somebody who could kind of permanently be alongside for this. Uh, the, the chemistry TJ and I have, I've heard is pretty good for football. I would agree. Uh, that was one of the reasons that I thought to bring him in. I've talked to him a lot before that, and I knew his personality would lend for a really good visual as well as just audio version of, of a podcast if people are only listening to it instead of watching this one will also be ported over to an audio podcast. As soon as we're done here, I will start that process. Um, but again, if you just want to reach out, let me know what you liked, what you didn't like, maybe some more direction you'd like to see out of this one. I would like to grab a, a big time sponsor to help present the podcast and also uh, a little bit more clips. Definitely more graphics will be coming. There's, there's no, no doubt of that. But again, I just wanted to get into this and get it rolling for the first episode. It was going to go as long or as short as anybody wanted. If I was getting all kinds of questions and comments, we'd go three hours. And if we just did a short little thing like it happened to be tonight, that's great too. Again, we're just getting into this, trying to bring it up, just like the conference overall. So hopefully you keep along with the journey. Hopefully this show continues to improve both video and audio-wise for our listeners and watchers out there, thanks for tuning in this first ever video edition of the Round Ball Roundup, and we'll see you again next week.